Great. So I'm Pamela Kahn. I'm the president of Bishop Weiscarver. I'm second generation owner of the company. My dad started the business uh, in 1950. As you heard, we're located in Pittsburgh, California. That causes us some issues. We're without the H. Um, and I have three older brothers. So actually, I'm in a role I didn't think I'd ever be in, to be honest. So, um, oh, I guess I've got this here. There we go. All right. So there's my dad uh, on the left, Bud, well known in the Bay Area. Um, he's of that generation that loved to make things. And as you can see here, he, uh, we made a lot of um, machinery um, for like level or blinds and standard oil and all of that. And what we do now is we make um, actuators. So we're in industrial automation. Uh, think of an MRI. The bed goes in, that slides back and forth. That's linear actuators. The magnet spins around to do the imaging. That's rotary. I sell both forms of actuations to OEM. So I don't necessarily make the whole machine, but I help the machine move. So that's what we do. And uh, there's my one of my last pictures with my dad, actually out on the floor. He's 91, um, so he doesn't come to work anymore. Um, so um, one of the things I wanted to talk about from a small business perspective is just the increasing burden that we have in doing the training, all training, basic training, how to do math, everything for the t for our employees. Um, so we have, uh, we do have a union out on the floor. We're still workers international for, um, our floor. Um, but I steel workers, SWI. Yeah. So, you know, on average, basically the first two weeks is pretty much solid <laughs> education just to get someone basic on the floor. Um, and there's, you know, increasing training requirements by state and federal. We've actually started our own internal university to uh, invest and train in our uh, employees. So we uh, just find that it's, it's harder and harder. We really can't find, quote unquote, turnkey employees for almost any type of job that we hire for. So the burden is pretty much 100% on us to train any of our employees. Um, we rely heavily, I liked the previous panel, on community colleges and our junior colleges. Uh, we were very involved at DBC in the machinist program. They took it away, now they brought it back, we're involved there. Um, I think I really liked how you said right size. I think one thing to think about is, um, so for us, we're out by Los Medanos. Los Madanos actually doesn't offer the type of training my workers need. My workers would need to actually go to Laney. Like Mark Martin does a fabulous job at Laney. Um, the problem is trainings during the day. Uh, when you don't have a lot of employees, <laughs> you can't take them off. So when do I need them to go get training? I need them to get training at night and on the weekends because we run really flat. We have to be highly efficient to be here in California. And I don't have a lot of depths of workers. A lot of, a lot of the stations are a one worker station. And if I take somebody out to send them to a program, there's no production. And I have to keep production going. So that would be sort of a right size thing to think about. So actually, as Lenny said, he was out uh, visiting us. Um, we've been really involved in um, manufacturing day uh, from the very beginning, it started actually on social media and it was a virtual thing and then it became a real thing and we've done it every single year. Uh, we had close to 300 students come through our facility this year and it's really a strong passion of mine to spread the word around manufacturing and I'll get into some of the data in the next slide. Um, there's my team at the East Bay Innovation Awards, really a proud of uh, my team and um, that was around a new product that we designed and then you can see my whole team and you can see yes we're um, a dog friendly environment not out on the production floor but um, so here are some of the data I don't want to spend too much time on this because everyone has access to these slides um, I actually want to highlight uh, piggyback on something that Mark said 
Um, you know, in, in manufacturing, uh, almost over 350,000 manufacturers across the country are actually sole proprietors. It's exactly what Mark was talking about. And then when it comes to small business, over 183,000 are 20 employees or less. Um, I'm at 60, so I'm just over that kind of that horizon you were talking about. Um, but even then, there's only 61,000 manufacturers that are 20 to 499 employees. And then you get the small amount above that of 500 and more. And that's less than 4,000. I think, though, there's a perception that every manufacturer is like Lockheed Martin or General Motors. And it's not. The heart of manufacturing is actually 10 employees or so. Very small. But we do, we keep everything going. So um, I am also certified woman-owned. So I'm very passionate about women in manufacturing and changing some of these numbers about getting more diversity into manufacturing and keeping girls involved in STEM based education. Um, it's, it's really sad to see the abandonment rate of girls going through school and they need to stay involved in STEM. Um, so here are two of my employees. So Alina on the left, she's actually my manufacturing engineer. She does a great job. And Quentin on the right, he's out in um, production. And um, this is part of the campaign that's up in Sacramento in the Senate. And so I'm just really proud of, of my team and the diversity of my team. And um, you can read why they love being in manufacturing. So, um, so like I was saying, I think what I think what employers need are help with the training. Um, I think community colleges and, and like I said, the junior colleges do great work, but most of it really has to happen in house. So we have to think about those policies that incentivize or help the small employers take on the burden of the training and all the training costs. Um, like I, I'm, like I said, we need to increase STEM education, but not, but also I find what we need to do is bring back the ability to have applied learning. We're very involved in FIRST Robotics. I've been a national and local support, um, supporter of FIRST Robotics for over a decade. Um, what Dean came in and Woody Flowers have done is, is, is amazing. Um, I can't tell you how many times I hear from the kids that I sponsor, and I make it important to sponsor all female robotic teams. I've also sponsored teams from continuation schools. And it was actually out of a continuation school on Treasure Island. One of these kids, hardcore gang member kind of kid, actually said, I actually didn't see a purpose to my life. But now I've been a part of the team. I've built something. And now I can start to see that I actually can contribute. And there's a value to me going to school. I mean, that's amazing. That's what we need to be installing in the next generation of our kids. And we need to tell them and show them why education matters. And when they can touch it and feel it and work in teams, it really does make a huge difference. Um, so <laughs> we need a 40 hour week. <laughs> Don't know what else to say. And I will tell you, probably the largest uh, request to go to a 40-hour week versus an eight-hour day, like our state has for manufacturing, um, is my union labor. They tend to be some of my younger employees. They have kids. Um, they want flex time. And once again, if you're a small employer, it's the cost of doing flex time with an eight hour day versus a 40 hour week, it's too punitive as much as you wanna do it. But I think this is a holdover from the way work was done decades ago. And it's not the way we work anymore. And it's not the way we live, live our lives. And our state is always being very proud about being at the head of things. We need to follow the rest of the country and have a 40 hour week. Um, regulation. Um, so I'm a manufacturer, as you saw, <laughs> and I love California. Family came here in a wagon from Iowa in 1853. 
We've been here for generations. I want clean water. I want clean air. I want all of that. I struggle with the fact that if I want to plate my product, which you need to do for industrial applications, I can't do it here. You know, with the free board, I'm not going to get into it and all of that. I can't plate my product in California because of environmental regulations. But you know what I have to do? Put it on a truck and truck it to Oregon. Get it plated, put it on a truck, and bring it back. I struggle with that one because I think that's actually probably worse environmental impact than if I could get it plated or coated here in California or the Bay Area. So um, it's a tough place to be. I love California. I love coming back here when I come. I travel a lot. Um, but I will tell you, everybody wants me to move my business somewhere else. Uh, anytime at a, any type of a meeting, trade association, trade show, um, everybody from that state wants to tell me why to move. And I'll tell you, it's, it's harder and harder to get to, to be here. Uh, I have had customers flat out say, I will not buy from you. And I ask them why, and they say, because you're in California. And if you're in California, I'm paying too much for your product, period. And so, I mean, you ha we have to think about the impact of all these regulations and things. I know, I know each one individually there's good behind it, but when you stack it up, you have to look at the disadvantage you're creating for many of the companies, especially when they're small, to actually compete. And I complete, I sell globally, not just in California. So I'm competing against other states. I'm competing against the people who are copying my product in China. And, and so I have to figure out how do I stay here and actually compete? Because when you all are buying something, you probably look for the cheapest price. And so do the buyers that I sell to. So it makes it tough. So thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm just going to ask a couple questions. So please, if you want to put your 10 cards up, and I see Senator Randall and Lance already. OK, so I'm going to ask one quick question, and so I can get to all of your questions. So, um, and I'll ask you, Mark, generally on your surveys and Pam on your, your specific business. So, why are you in California? Why are businesses in California? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are a, a number of reasons. One is um, many small, it, it depends on the industry, right? I mean, we know that small business growth uh, tracks generally with sort of industry growth um, in the region. So um, the, the place and the location of that small business connected to the larger industries that surround it is essential for the growth of that business. So as we have industry clusters that uh, where there's intentional investment, intentional growth, you're going to see small businesses connected to those industry clusters. And so um, the choices of those small businesses to stay are that this is where those industries are and this is where I can see, see my growth. I think also um, something to mention is that um, there are uh, really unique uh, benefits that exist for some small employers, many small employers, in terms of offering their employees that I just want to highlight. One is that um, we actually have a functioning and robust uh, individual insurance marketplace to cover California. We know that small employers who are less than 50, uh, they don't have to offer insurance, um, but they can if they'd like to. And so there's an option to sort of buy up. Um, and we've actually done the Affordable Care Act right here in California in many ways. There's still challenges. And this governor has taken a huge steps to make it even more affordable uh, for individuals who work in small, uh, small businesses as well as entrepreneurs themselves. So when you have a marketplace that allows an entrepreneur to know, if I start my business, I can still get affordable insurance. If I'm growing my business and I'm not quite there yet to be able to offer insurance, I know my, my employees can get insurance. That's very attractive, especially as you think about the really small businesses and, and their desire to take care of their employees. Uh, we also have a statewide uh, paid leave program that is administered by the state. So that takes the administrative 
burden off of small employers. Um, it's employee funded. It's not costing the employers anything. Um, and it's something that uh, small employers don't really know about in general. We, we talk to them quite a bit about it so that they understand there's this unique benefit that they have. But that's something that's valuable that they embrace and say, this is this is a great opportunity for me to, to really own this and say, this is a great benefit that a small business and an employee here in California. And then last, I also mentioned a really exciting program, CalSavers. Uh, so CalSavers is a retirement product that's going to be portable, uh, that's going to be this, that rolled out uh, this year. Uh, so an employer of five or more um, will have, uh, won't have to pay for a retirement product for their employees, uh, won't have to administer the, re the retirement product, um, and they're not uh, liable, the fiduciary liability, right? Those three sort of challenges. So a small business owner here in California, just by existing in California because of the framework around it, actually is able to offer um, a little bit higher quality of job than exists in other states. Right. And there's there's value to that. And that's something that many small business owners understand. Um, you know, but, but to mention, right, the administrative complexity is still a challenge. And so as you think about moving forward, um, I would also encourage um, uh, as we think about solutions in those three barriers, think about uh, how are how are we not leveraging technology to solve those barriers and how could we. Right. I think there are incredible opportunities. Tech has done a really good job of thinking about the consumer market. How are we solving convenience in the consumer market? You know, but I think there. Are, how are we solving cost, administrative complexity, and liability in the small business market? Right. How? What are the public-private partnerships that we need to drive those solutions? And how can we make sure that the quality of job that's uh, supported by existing in California is actually uh, reducing burdens on small businesses and continues to be more? Thank you, Pam. Well, I think I already answered it. Right now, it's a, it's a family thing. You know, we've been here for decades. My dad built the company. Um, we have a lot of land. I mean, we own our, our building and our land. So moving is a little bit tough for us. Um, so, I mean, that's why we are here. Another program I'd like to give a shout out to, which I always call the best kept secret in California, is ETP. Um, Whenever I talk about ETP, I have a line of people um, after the meeting saying, oh, what is this program? And they've never heard about it. Um, so I think that's something that more small businesses need to know about ETP. But I think we also need to make it um, easier to access. Uh, the, the access is quite complex to get your ETP dollars. Just to add to that, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, I think so the ETP is the employment training panel. So these are... Uh, state dollar or these are uh, employer dollars that are going into a program that then allow training uh, and upskilling within uh, within businesses um, it, it can be challenging from the administrative end of it to uh, get those dollars because the reimbursement window is really long um, the application process can sometimes be challenging um, and it can be really tough for really small businesses because um, oftentimes you need a consultant to come and do the application for you um, and sometimes there are these uh, uh, they're called multi multiple multi-employer plans that some workforce boards run to try to get more small businesses plugged in um, but again right I think that's a that's a real, it's a really great program that gets dollars back into training. Um, and uh, in any way that we can continue to address those challenges that small business owners have in accessing that, right? What are the technology solutions? What are the policy solutions? Um, it's a great program that really, I think, um, could use uh, additional support there. Okay, great. Now we're gonna go to questions and here's what I'm gonna do so you can take your cards down. I've got the ones who have had them. We're gonna, I'm gonna take two at a time and then we'll have them respond. So I've got, uh, in the order that I received them, Governor Granholm Lance, got Carla and Roy, and I've got John and Doug, and then Faith. Faith. Okay, so Governor. Um, thanks so much. Um, I'm the former governor of Michigan, and Pam, I would have been on your doorstep to get you to come to Michigan, and I kid you not, I came to yeah. California. Michigan I has already. I, bet, I, mean, I, I have no doubt, and I, when I was governor, I would come to California, Lenny, and I would say to these startups in particular, you've got a great product, you're not going to take it to scale here. There's no way you can afford to do that. Come to Michigan. We will make you an offer you can't refuse. We'll give you free land. We'll help to subsidize your building. We will do whatever it takes to get you here. It is an issue that California, I, I've been curious about how businesses choose to stay in light of the costs here. It's so ridiculously expensive. Granted, you get great employees. So first question is to you, because you were saying, Pam, about training. What if the state offered some kind of subsidized training 
that allowed for you to be able to hire people and work them alongside folks in your work, but allowed them to actually be paid initially by the state, but in a gradation, and eventually you absorb the cost of it because you've decided to keep them on. What if the state offered something like that? Would that help to relieve some of your concerns, number, number one? Um, and then the second thing is, along the lines of what you were saying regarding portable benefits, um, I don't understand why California has not leveraged their platform economy to create a, a portable benefit system it's much more robust than what exists. You could totally be leading. I, I don't know who can answer that, but would that also be something that would help to um, to attract and retain businesses in California? Okay, great. Thank you. And we're glad you're in California and recruiting companies to California now. So, <laughs> Lance. I do think the state needs to get creative about the, the training, whether it's a funded sort of like apprentice style co-op style of training, whether it's like R&D and you get training credits and tax credits for spending on training. But I, I think there's a there's a lot of things that we could do. I'd be definitely interested in it. I mean, devil's in the details. So, I mean, how it gets administered and what would be required. But, I mean, that's definitely something I would be interested in. Um, I don't know if I'm the one to speak to the portability of, of benefits. I would... I would tell you that the one thing that um, I think is a disservice to workers from being was at this on the state um, workforce development board for quite a few years is the lack of portability around um, the training and like the, the certificates and that. So, you know, you're in the down in the Inland Empire and you go through a specific um, program to be a welder or something for like Northrop Grumman, but there's no portability of that. You come up and then to the Bay Area and Chevron doesn't recognize that training program. Like that's a disservice. That's a disservice to people who have spent time going through and getting training. We need, we need a flatter type of um, system that allows the, the portability for the worker to be able to work at least anywhere within the state. I mean, even better to be able to go outside of that. But you see very tight um, training that happens that doesn't allow portability. Hold on, that answer. Let me let, let Lance get in as well. Thank you very much. And I just want to say to the commissioners and the, the publics here and the folks that are watching on the Internet, um, what you're witnessing right now is the future or the present and future narrative of the manufacturing sector right in front of you. Pamela Kahn represents more manufacturers in concept and in practice than you could possibly imagine. There are 30,000 manufacturers in California. 95% at least of those are small to medium-sized manufacturers. She just presented to you the daily challenges of what she faces just to make things here in California. And the, the, one of the reasons why you know, Pamela is so fantastic is the authenticity with which she brings the information to the table. This is a family business. It's not that large manufacturer that people think, Hollywood thinks, others think is the manufacturing sector. And here in Los Angeles, since we're here, job growth rate in the manufacturing sector is negative. It's down 7%. Primarily made up of small and medium manufacturers that are facing the challenges that she described in order to keep their doors open, keep people employed, and keep making things, which of course, as you know, creates wealth for our economy and the communities and the workers. So within this context are a bunch of solutions that we need to talk about. We've been focusing a lot on the employer-employee dynamic, but some attention needs to be focused on those who actually provide the jobs. So what we're trying to solve, I think, as a commission, is a multi-dimensional, I was going to say three-dimensional, but it's probably a four-dimensional equation that we're trying to solve here. But hearing the perspective um, of both panelists this morning has been helpful, but you know, file this away. This is the new narrative of the manufacturing sector. It's not dirty, dark, and dangerous like it once was. It's not that way anymore. So the, the more that we can all understand what we've come to know in our sector, I think the, the, the better off we'll all be as a commission. I'm sorry there's not a question in there, but I, I did want to offer that okay. up. Okay, thank you. So then why don't we let um, Mark answer the portability question, and then, then I will go to um, Carla and Roy. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yes, I mean, I think there's incredible opportunity to really explore portability. Um, but I think there's also um, a way to think about what we already have and, and how do we think about 
um, how do we think about addressing all the different sort of benefits that are out there, whether it's paid leave, right? That's through EDD. We have covered California. That's its own thing. Cal Savers is the, you know, through the treasury partner and uh, uh, is on the, on the board and, and runs that. And so, right. How are, how are we thinking about all the different departments that are out there that have a piece of what, of a benefit already? Um, and then what are we doing to right size this for a small manufacturer? Like, what are we doing to use technology to make that easier? And I do want to just touch on, on Commissioner Hastings' uh, com- uh, comments because small manufacturers are training the workforce of tomorrow because they have to, <laughs> right? They are doing this training. And so what are we, how does our workforce system support the manufacturers in the training they're doing? Like ETP is a great program. So maybe there are ways to think about fr- um, putting money in at the front to make it easier to, to make that happen, right? Maybe that's the policy lever and maybe we figure out how to make that work. But um Small, many small businesses and other industries are training the workforce of tomorrow in many different ways. So how are we leveraging what's already happening and supporting that and, and encouraging that in a way that fits into the broader, into the broader framework? Okay. Can, can I just address yeah, the go- One thing I do want to say, I know this is probably not a really correct thing to say, is that I think we overemphasize four-year schools. And I see that as well in the kids. It's really... For some kids, especially if they want to make things, and I think if you looked looked at the data, manufacturing pays really well, pays better than the service jobs you've been talking about. And if you have a kid who loves to make things, you shouldn't tell them that he can't support a family or she on making things because they can. And but they don't need to go to a four-year school. I mean, and that's the other reason why we there's so much burden for training on us because kids are dropping out instead. Because they figure, I'm not going to go to a four-year school. I'm just going to drop out. We should keep them engaged. We, we shouldn't see that as tracking them. And we should encourage them to do the type of jobs that they want to do. Because they can get paid very well to do those type of jobs. Great. Carla and then Roy. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, just two questions. One on the topic of... Uh, kind of basic job prep and maybe reflecting on the issue of incarceration. What are, what are the issues for you on just people coming in the door? What, what are the training and preparation issues that you face? Are you able to get the right people in the door? Should we be doing more around that? And is incarceration a barrier to that? Um, and then second, just you've mentioned a lot of things around training and upward mobility ETP and, you know, the efforts you're making, et cetera. I guess I'm wondering, you know, if I'm working in food service and I want to get into manufacturing, like, how would I do, you know, what, so I'm just interested in, like, what are the really practical barriers and then opportunities where we could make a difference in trying to help people who are already in the economy but maybe want to get into your, uh, you know, your sector and, um, and move on, move up. And maybe as you reflect on this, I, I appreciate it. You've already said a few, a few of these, but what's working well? You know, where do you see think bright spots that are working that we could do more of? Why don't you ask yours now and then we'll do combine. <clears throat> uh, I see a puzzle, which is we've had this tremendous economic growth in the state and the previous session reminded us of all the ways in which lower wage workers are struggling. And yet, you know, some of the message I'm hearing from you about employers is that employers are struggling too. And so who, who, if not employers, is succeeding, you know, if you believe that workers should have higher wages, what do you see as employers' role in it? And in particular, I think it'd be great to get your reactions to policy proposals you may have heard earlier or things you think this commission might be likely to recommend that you think may be a bad idea that you want to anticipate, but just getting you to reflect on the role of the employer in raising wages for workers would be terrific. Thank you. Great. Kim, do you want to answer the first set of ones from oh, Carla? Okay. Um, shoot. I'm trying to read my own notes. Um, well, first off, you need them to show up for the interview. 
And I will tell you, that's actually an interesting struggle is to actually get them to come to the interview and, and do all of that. Let's, let's just take your question of food to manufacturing. I think one of the things that needs to happen is that the message from the state and from the media needs to be that manufacturing isn't dead because what they actually hear is that manufacturing's dying, that it's a dark, dirty, dingy job, um, and it's not any place that somebody would want to work. It's one reason why I'm really passionate about Manufacturing Day and getting people to come in and see my facility, and it's bright, and it's clean, and it's an engaging place to be, and we use lots of technology. Uh, it's very engaging. But I think that's part of the narrative is to actually tell people that it is a very viable long-term career you can go after. Um, like I said, we're mm -hmm. going to train most of the people who come to us. They're going to start out in production, production first class. We're going to train them, and we're going to work them up through the system. Yeah, um, you know, I think um, uh, what, we've, what we heard uh, consistently also just sort of from the front end hiring piece um, is the, the challenge as you sort of articulated that we all sort of know is as a small business owner, like I, I can do a lot of the technical training in house. Like I can get them to do that. Um, I just, I just want somebody who wants to come and work and, and be, and be here and present and sort of have that, that framework. And so I think um, thinking about, um, yeah, think, thinking about sort of how our education system and workforce development programs are addressing that big challenge, essential skills, whatever you want to call it, I think is, I mean, it's always something, it's, it's sort of broken record, everyone always talks about it, um, but I still think it's something that is, needs to be part of the conversation. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of thinking about, um, you know, uh, increasing wages, and I mean, really, when, I think that it's essential that we have a conversation about what that floor is, right? Like, what is that floor for folks, whether it's wages, whether it's benefits, um, but I think it's, it needs to be coupled with also a conversation of how are we empowering entrepreneurs and really small businesses with right size solutions to, to have them get there. I mean, I know from a lot of the conversations that I've had anecdotally with small business owners, even around the minimum wage, there are many small business owners who are not upset about the minimum wage being increased. Um, there are many who say, um, you know, I have to keep my wages competitive, right? I can pay maybe a little bit above, but I have to be competitive. I'm not competitive. Um, I'm not going to have a business. And so I want to figure out how, how far can I push that? Um, the main thing we hear from small employers around the increasing minimum wages is just, can you help me figure out how to absorb that cost in my business? Do I need to increase that product more? Do I need to change this, this workflow policy? Are there some technology solutions that are going to reduce my costs so that those, that money can go back to, to, to wages? So I think um, there, there, not all employ not all employers are made equal, right? There are some that are looking for ways to to um, race to the bottom, but um, based on our polling and our data and what we see, um, the vast majority are not, and the vast majority are looking for solutions to be empowered to create uh, uh, opportunities, especially small employers, because of that unique dynamic that you have. And so, I think the way the floor conversation on wages has to happen, and then the last piece is as a small business owner. Um, you're, you are, to some degree, constrained by your industry in terms of wages, right? In terms of if I'm in an industry that happens to be a low-wage industry, um, I can push as hard as I can for me. Uh, but at the same time, I, I've talked to many small business owners that they're pricing their way, they are, they are pricing their products above market rate by a little bit because they want to make sure that they are trying to attract better talented folks and so are paying folks more. Um, but it's still technically low-wage because that's the industry they're in. So is so. You have to have a conversation about the wage floor, but I think you also have to think about what are the empowering tools that are going to allow folks to get to solutions. For me, let me grow. That's how I pay people more. So as I grow as a company and I expand and I have more jobs and I can have more layers, I can pay people more and I can retain and engage them. So, I mean, when we were 20 employees, I didn't have... 40 of the people I had now. I didn't have some of the higher level jobs that I had now. And my goal is to retain and attract and engage my employees. And I do that because as we grow, I can challenge them. I can grow them up into higher level jobs. And when I can grow them up into higher level jobs, I pay them more. That's how, and that's how I grow. So it's, it's, it's all an ecosystem. Okay. Um, John and then Doug. Great. Thank you very much uh, for this panel. I really appreciate uh, both of your perspectives. Um, 
I wanted to pick up on the point, Pamela, that you had raised a second ago about this narrative that manufacturing is dying. And you know, I think you know, certainly this commission has been exposed to some research that suggests you know production, jobs, and manufacturing are going to go away potentially through automation. Uh, the tasks that are currently done by humans can be uh, you know replaced with with machines, and then the few remaining tasks that are there are either going to be high compensated jobs with four year degrees or something, or very menial tasks that can be completed through platform labor. Um, you don't appear to be doing that. You're hiring people who you're tr looking to, to train and have them do that work for a foreseeable future. Um, why is that? Why isn't automation and sort of the gig economy an alternative that you are finding to be realistic or desirable right now and in the future? Does it make sense for us to invest in training a workforce if it's going to meet um, sort of that uncertain fate. And before you answer that, let me get Doug in here as well, and then we'll answer both. Thank you, and I really appreciate your comments about ETP, and I want to follow up on that. At the last commission meeting, I, I shared a story of all the work we did to steer funding towards a, a large manufacturer, a, a bus company, uh, where we have 500 members, just to get them to stay in California, and how we couldn't compete with any other state in the country. Um, I'd like to hear more about the challenges around ETP. From our perspective, the good things about ETP, or California competes for that matter, is it sets a wage floor for the workers. And for ETP, as you know, there's a requirement that you actually retain people before you get money, and that employers actually have to match the money that the state puts in. And I see Tim Rainey, the executive director of the California Workforce Development Board back there, who's investing in a training partnership, high road training partnership we're a part of, that requires employers and labor to be at the table together to commit to creating good jobs. So. This is my very long-winded way of asking, from your perspective, what are the challenges to getting this funding, and what could we do to replicate and build on the successes that we're having? Great. We'll answer those, and then we have one more question, and I'm actually going to get this wrapped on time. So go ahead. I'll take the automation. You can take ETP. <laughs> um, so, Obviously, I love automation. I sell automation products. So <laughs> um, I want people to automate. I think this is where people don't really understand how jobs are shifting. And I think this is more a story about scaring people than the, real, than the reality of it. So you've been to our facility. We have UR5s. We have robots. Hasn't, hasn't, not one person has lost their job. Now, have we spent money training them? to do other things? Yes. Um, I think automation is great. I think automation is really good for the human body because there are certain things like out on my floor where really a person shouldn't be doing that repetitive task all day long. We should want a robot to be doing that. But where I want that person is where they can work uh, collaboratively with coming up with other solutions, uh, the way they learn how to program the machines, and work on efficiencies and different types of things on the floor. I think that's a much better use of my talent out on the floor. Um, having somebody do the same task all day long, I don't think is the best use of a human. So um, for, for us, we, we look at it really differently. I, I would say, I, you know, I heard a lot of the same things when actually computers came in that we weren't gonna have any jobs because computers were on, and that hasn't happened. Just like we weren't supposed to use paper anymore. Well, that hasn't happened. I think there's a narrative out there that automation's gonna take all the jobs away. It's not gonna take it away, but just like with computers, the type of work we're gonna do is gonna change. So this is where, once again, we have to really think about the solutions and our educational platforms, and what do we need to be doing to change how work is going to be done 
you know, like I said, working collaboratively, having critical thinking skills, those are going to be really important things. Um, having the ability, it's about brains, not brawn. Having the ability of picking something up here and going like this all day is not going to be how we define work. But I think that's actually a really good thing. And I just real 30, 10 seconds on this. In terms of the, um, you know, the, the specifically with the type of work that's being done in, in automation, right? I think that's why the talking about this as skills is so critical because in small businesses that are nimble and that are going in, they're doing manufacturing or other work, they are creating skills in, uh, in their employees that are marketable, not just in that space, but in other spaces. So continuing to think about it from a, a skills frame of what are small businesses doing to create additional skills and different opportunities, I think um, can be informative as we think about workforce. And just on the, on the ETP um, question, great question. I think um, it's definitely a program that has that works really well for a number of employers. I think some of the challenges that we see as a small business organization are that the really small employee, the less scale you have, the more challenging it is. So the, there's administrative cost um, and overhead, again, those three barriers, right? Cost, administrative challenge, and, and uh, liability. The administrative challenge is pretty significant to try to figure out how to track it and get all, um, right? There, ETP, I think, is just going digital January 1, 2020. So it's still tracking with paper, you know, hours. And so it's a great program, has tons of potential, but I think really assessing how are we making this administratively feasible for really small employers? And if I'm an employer, maybe I want two or three of my employees to go. That's not big enough for me to go get my own ETP contract. I have to go partner with somebody else. And then how do I fit in? And what we hear from employers and ETP trainers is that um, that administrative burden is actually preventing folks from even getting free money, right? They're saying, I'm doing this training anyway, but the administrative cost of me to figure out how to comply here, that's, this is not worth my time. I'm just going to upskill my employees on my own. So it's really thinking about how are we really digging in on that administrative piece to make it a uh, right size for really small companies. Okay, great. Fei you have a last question. Hi. I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, well, the first one is for both of you, which is... Um, We've heard some of the challenges, including cost and, uh, and training. Um, I would love to just hear for each of you to list the top three biggest challenges for recruiting and retaining employees for small businesses. You can define it as smaller than 50, but Pamela, your, your company counts too. <laughs> um, that's the first question. Second question is um, uh, more for Pam and uh, I just heard your answer to uh, John's question about automation. And as a robotics professor myself, I also uh, share a lot of uh, belief of what you said. But my question is actually the unintended consequences of automation in manufacturing. What are the potential unintended, especially adversarial consequences that, uh, that we should at this point start for? Uh, foreseeing and projecting, um, in, in, especially with technology and automation in manufacturing. All right, so top three, recruiting, retaining. Um, so I heard about the caring company from the panel before. Um, I go to the sediments that Mark talked about. I think when you're a small employer, my number one asset is my employees, so I care a lot. Um, we offered full health care uh, before we were unionized. We're actually the longest continuer um, offering of Kaiser in the East Bay is our company. My dad firmly believed in it. And so, um, so one way I compete is I actually offer a lot of benefits. And I'm very rich in what I pay. I do profit sharing, 401k. We do full um, health care benefits. Uh, we do, uh, obviously, a lot around training. We also um, do, in terms of people want to go to schools, so we offset the tuition fees. I mean, I could go on and on. So that's one way I can be. And, and it's hard for me, from my size, because um, especially for me, when trying to get engineers, trying to get compete against Apple and Google and, you know, the, the big brands, it's tough. Um, Headhunting is fierce. 
from those companies and Tesla. It's very, very hard for me. And one reason why I am here is that type of talent with the engineering programs coming out of Stanford, Berkeley, Davis, you know, they're great. It's really hard to get a kid uh, or a young person to want to stay in a company my size. Kind of goes back to your question because I'm fairly flat. Like their career ladder doesn't have as long a runway as what they see if they go to like an Apple, right? So that's the type of stuff I work on for recruiting. Um, we pay a lot of recruiting fees. It's really, really expensive. That's the other way we do it. Um, you know, and I, that's, so that's for me. Um, unintended consequences. Uh, well, I think it's actually for all of us. I mean, I think we really are coming into, uh, you know, the K to gray. And we have to think about it's not just about educating kids through high school or maybe college, is that I think we have to look at careers and career skill sets as being lifelong learning. And so I think as we continue to automate, jobs are going to keep changing. And I think there needs to be um, an understanding that the job you get hired for is going to consistently change. And as automation keeps changing how we do work, we have to keep changing. And everyone has to understand that work, the future of work is not like a fixed endpoint. The future of work is going to keep moving. And so we all have to figure out those platforms that allow us to keep moving, to keep everybody skilled in a way that allows them to stay employed. Great. Thank you. Mark, do you have any reactions on, or closing thoughts? Um, you know, I'll, I'll just, I mean, I think in terms of uh, thinking about attracting and retaining talent, right, as, as, as Pamela mentioned, uh, right, getting the essential skill piece, right, I mean, that's sort of, there's specific tech skill, technical skills for certain industries, but really just the idea that um, how, how are, you know, how folks are showing up to work to uh, be engaged and be successful um, and, and, and the challenge there. I mean, we just, our, our friends at Irvine supported us to um, do a whole bunch of focus groups around the state to really look, talk to small business owners and walk through, like, what are your big challenges? And even before we got to the workforce question, they all brought it up. I, it's hard to find folks who want to who want to work, who want to show up and be there. And I think there's a huge disconnect between a lot of sort of business owners and their understanding and expectations of employees, and then the expectations of of people coming into work. And there's a big disconnect there. I think it's generational, but I think there are a number of other things at play. And I think bridging that divide. I don't think it's on one side or the other. I don't think it's just the the, the fault of folks coming in saying uh, that um, are looking for jobs that are being accused of not being ready to work. Um, I don't think. I, I think that that's a, a I think that I don't think that's the right frame because I think there's serious challenges there. So I think think really digging into that that aspect. And then the other piece is how do you how do you keep folks right? I mean, um, a lot of the small business owners that we work with are constantly trying to compete against the really big companies that have scale, right? They can put money in different places. So benefits and and flexible work schedules and things like that. Okay, um, I'm not going to try and synthesize because uh, it's impossible for that range of a conversation shortly. And secondly, we're late for lunch and I'm hungry. So um, I'm just going to uh, ask you all to give another round of applause for Mark and Dan for spending.